Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing well. I'm super excited for this video because we're going to be talking all about watercolor art supplies. I feel like there's a ton of videos online about watercolor supplies for beginners and then not so much after that initial stage. So more professional materials and different materials that you might want to consider upgrading or trying more expensive versions of those things and just I guess what's important to consider maybe upgrading down the line past that beginner stage and that's what I want this video to be. So today I'm going to be sharing my all-time favorite watercolor supplies that I have discovered over my I think like 10 plus years of watercolor painting at this point and these are the best things that I have found during that time and my absolute favorites. So whether you're someone more at the end of that beginner's stage or are someone with a lot more experience and are more along the lines of a professional artist at this point, hopefully you will find these recommendations interesting and helpful. And of course, please feel free to leave any of your watercolor supplies recommendations in the comments. I always love reading through those and I'm sure a lot of other people coming across this video will find that super helpful as well. But let's start off with the base, the foundation of a watercolor painting, the paper. Now I have admittedly turned into a watercolor paper snob over time. I was never like this. It has been within the last year because I realized just how much the watercolor paper affects the overall piece. I did a whole video on it that I will card here because it's honestly insane how much the paper can change the overall outcome of your work using the exact same paints. So definitely do not sleep on the importance of having reasonable quality watercolor paper to work on. I would actually say straight off of the bat if you are somebody that is looking at upgrading some of your more beginner materials I would possibly start with the paper that you're using. The first paper that I want to talk about might actually be my favorite watercolor paper that I have found because it is a really great in-between of incredible quality and attributes that I personally like in a watercolor paper while not being absolutely obscenely expensive. And that is the Winsor & Newton professional watercolor paper. And I'm definitely going to do other shots of this considering it's taking up the whole frame. This is obviously quite a large pack. It is a 12 by 16 inch watercolor block, but this particular paper it does come in the usual different types. You've got cold pressed, which is this one, hot pressed and rough. This definitely comes in individual full sheets, but for the most part you will find this paper in watercolor blocks, which if you don't know what a watercolor block is, instead of it being like a pad of paper, the four sides of the individual paper sheets are all glued down. So you can use the paper straight on this pad without having to tape down any of the edges or anything if that's something that you prefer to do because thanks to the glue on all four sides it is already you know glued down and good to go. This is 100% cotton watercolor paper but like I did just sort of mention not crazy expensive considering it is a 100% cotton watercolor paper. I believe this pack which like I mentioned it is a 12 by 16 inch block there are 20 sheets in it and I believe this particular one was less than 60 Canadian dollars. Which when you compare that to this other watercolor paper that I want to talk about, the exact same size of watercolor block but 10 sheets, although it is twice as thick so you know asterisk there, uh, it's like 90. <laughs> so really quite reasonable I would say for the quality that this paper is. It's super strong. I've never had any like warping issues. I have absolutely beat this paper with water and when I've removed it from the block it has been practically flat. I just personally really love how this paper reacts. It works very well for the style of watercolor painting that I do. So if you were able to get the Winsor Newton Professional watercolor paper wherever you are then I would highly recommend trying it out if you haven't already. The next Thing that I did sort of tease before is this watercolor paper which this is just a sheet because I bought it in a large sheet and this is just one of my cut pieces. This is the Arches 300 pound watercolor paper. So it is 640 GSM. It's incredibly thick as you can probably tell from me handling it. It's practically a piece of cardboard for how thick it is. But this is the watercolor paper that ruined me. <laughs> Obviously Arches paper is known for its quality and this being the extra thick stuff is you know even better. But I originally bought this paper to use for a painting series and I have struggled to go back to using anything else since then. No, but this stuff is 
crazy expensive. It is cheaper if you buy it in the large, I want to say 22 by 30 inch sheets, but I'm not entirely sure if that's accurate. But yeah, this stuff probably the most easily you would buy in the large sheets and cut it down, which is incredibly nerve wracking because I am pretty sure that this paper is like, I want to say 35 Canadian dollars per sheet. It's something painful like that, but it is really, really nice. The one reason I don't have this as like my ultimate favorite paper, even though kind of is, depends on the project. Because I would say for a lot of different types of paintings, depending on what kind of painter you are, I am typically only pretty much working on finished, full-fledged pieces of art, so I don't mind spending or using a paper that is more expensive. Like I completely understand not wanting to do like little sketches or like test paintings on this paper, but for me I am looking at like fully finished paintings and pieces of artwork that you know are taking me days, weeks, whatever to finish. And so this even for me is sometimes overkill. It really would depend on the specifics of the painting, which is why the Windsor Newton is probably my preferred paper because definitely do not feel as bad using it, but it also just works for a lot more situations for me. But if I was doing like edge to edge crazy painting that I knew I was gonna spend a lot of time on, I'm probably gonna use this stuff. Another type of paper that I really enjoy using, although I'm not sure if you would actually classify this as paper, because they are these Canson art boards, which art boards are essentially like mounted watercolor paper on more of a cardboard back, so they are super thick. They definitely do not bend, but the extra strength of them being an art board is really nice if you're doing like an edge to edge edge painting. They hold up really well, don't do any of the weird warping things that a lot of less expensive watercolor paper can tend to do. And so yeah, highly recommend those as well. But like I sort of mentioned, I'm really not someone that's been doing a lot of watercolor sketches, at least for the last couple of years, but I feel like this could be considered a sketchbook. It is this indigo art paper watercolor spiral bound pad, but this is a really cool paper pad. It has the deckled edges, which is when the the edges are unfinished. It is this handmade paper. Again, it is 100% cotton, but it's also super interesting because in between the individual sheets, you can see I have a painting in here, there is this like tracing paper vellum to separate the two sides. So if you wanted to paint on both sides of the paper, you wouldn't have to worry about the opposite painting like messing up the one that it would be touching when the book is closed. Here I have some Killing Eve artwork that I've apparently never taken out of this pad. And you can see for this painting, it is like edge to edge watercolor and you probably can't really tell any more warping for that piece of paper compared to the other ones. They're not incredibly flat pieces of paper to start with. I'm not entirely sure if that's like something to do with the more like handmade process of making the paper. You can probably tell from the edge of the book there just, you know, it's not as flat as some other sketchbooks you might be more familiar with. And yeah, that top painting is really not much more warped than any of the sheets underneath that are unused. I will say this paper does have a bit more of a linear tooth or texture to it. I'm not entirely sure how to describe it. It's just the texture that you see when you paint on it is more linear than some of the other watercolor papers that I feel like are more like speckled and toothy in that way. So it's just something to keep in mind. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It's interesting to have different tooths and textures in your paintings, I feel like. It's just more of a specific texture than some of the other papers have. In terms of a more traditional sketchbook, again, not something that I've really been using lately, but like a year ago or a few months ago, I did try out the Etcher sketchbooks that I believe have 100% cotton watercolor paper in them. I have like a mixed media one, so it's not actually the thickest paper that you can get in them, but it was a really nice sketchbook, so if you are Someone that tends to do or enjoys using a sketchbook for their work as opposed to more like individual pieces of paper, then those might be something that you are interested in checking out. That's not exactly my area of forte at the moment as I haven't been doing much work in sketchbooks lately. But I did just want to make a little side note for those because when I did use that one, it was really, really nice. So those are all the papers that I want to talk about, but let's get into some really important accessories and side bits that will make watercolor painting possible. 
Starting off with something incredibly boring, but I do use these all of the time. They're masonite boards. These ones are very small ones compared to what I'm typically using, but you know, <laughs> I wanted to make sure they would fit on frame. I believe they're both considered masonite boards. They are like very different textures, which is why I grabbed one of each because depending on where you're possibly from and what your local art supply stores have, they could look different than either of these. But these are what I constantly am taping individual sheets of watercolor paper onto, even the super thick stuff. One, I just find it way more convenient to handle this like incredibly sturdy board, which is also why you're using it to tape it down onto, because it means if any warping is going to happen, the taping of the paper onto one of these is going to minimize that. So they come in a million different sizes. I will say as a side note though, if you are using a particular size paper all of the time, like say you're using 10 by 14 inch watercolor paper most of the time, I would size up your masonite board that you're taping it onto because I find it a lot more convenient to be able to tape the edges down onto the like front side of the board as opposed to having to wrap the tape around the board. So if you were using a 10 by 14 inch watercolor paper, I would use a 12 by 16 inch masonite board or something along the lines of that. You know, if you're using nine by 12 watercolor paper, do 11 by 14 masonite board. The boards tend to be cut into like the more typical art paper sizes. So that's why I'm throwing those numbers out. So yeah, there's a little side tip for you. Of course, to go along with those masonite boards, if you are using individual sheets of watercolor paper, you are going to also need tape. I basically only use this 3M Blue Painter's Tape. I've never had any crazy issue with it. I know some people complain about the tape like ruining the front of the paper, you know, ripping the edges up, doing stuff like that. You technically can heat up the tape and it will reactivate the adhesive more so that it's easier to pull off if you're really concerned about that. But for the most part, I've really not had an issue with this tape if you're being careful with removing it. Technically, all tape has an adhesive safety level, so this tape you maybe are not supposed to leave on for more than seven days. The different types of tape definitely have different like adhesive safety levels in which you're supposed to remove the tape before that for like no damage to generally walls in this case. So maybe look that up, but if you are someone that's more concerned about damaging the paper, I also quite frequently use this painter's tape, and this purple kind is specifically delicate surface tape. So as the name would suggest, it is meant for more delicate surfaces. The adhesive isn't as strong as the blue stuff. And so with this stuff, you really do not have to worry about it damaging the surface of the paper. It's very washi tape-like. It's like a thick washi tape, I would say. I feel like the adhesive is stronger than washi tape though, and it also comes in various thicknesses. This stuff is what I typically use. I want to say it's an inch and a half, but I also know tape sizes are incredibly unusual. I will list exactly what size this is in the description, along with all of the materials that I talk about in this video. Uh, but I will make sure to figure out exactly how wide this is and list that there. And this is generally a good size for taping down the edges of paper. Something that goes along the lines of the more general setup for watercolor painting for me are these. These are one of my longest all-time favorite art supplies. They're called light pad pucks. What these were originally created for was elevating a light box. I believe these are getting increasingly more difficult to find because I'm not entirely sure if they make them anymore, so I'm sorry if they're like non-existently difficult to get. I have always considered looking at developing something like these because I'm just obsessed with these. They're so incredibly useful and simple and so the general idea of these are they are like an incredibly small and portable easel. You stack as many as you want underneath your you know watercolor paper board whatever you are using and it elevates that surface to whatever angle you want. And so I find myself using these all of the time for watercolor painting because they are a significantly smaller angle than you would get with an easel. You know, you really can't have a very steep angle when you're watercolor painting because the water is just gonna like drip off of the page. Sometimes you want that, but I guarantee you probably don't want that all of the time. So normally you are probably looking at working on a more flat and level surface than like acrylic painting or something along the lines of that. But for the times you are working on a large 
larger piece or something where you really need it on a bit of an angle to be able to see what you're doing, these are the answer for that. I did want to briefly go over some materials that I used when starting a watercolor painting because I'm not someone that's just, you know, going in straight with the paint. So in terms of pencils for any sketching and drawing that I do beforehand, I only use one of three pencils. I'm either using the Palomino Blackwing 602 pencil, a 2H pencil, or a Pentel Orance mechanical pencil, which these are my all-time favorite mechanical pencils, and specifically I'm most likely using the 0.2 millimeter one. Now the reason that I use these specific pencils only, the 2H one is because I don't like a super dark sketch underneath a lot of the time, and so for the longest time I would only use a 2H pencil and I refuse to use anything softer lead-wise, especially because I feel like I'm quite heavy-handed in terms of sketching, and so things would just get way too dark and impossible to erase back lighter if I didn't really want the pencil lines to be visible, and so 2H was always the way to go for me. The Palomino Blackwing is sort of my way around that because I find myself sketching with this one lighter because it is a darker lead, but it's also super easily removable as opposed to some of the other pencils. I don't know, I really like these pencils and so I sometimes, although slightly less frequently than the 2H pencil, uh, will find myself using these. These tend to be the pencil that I prefer to sketch with. I just find my drawings a lot more loose because of the specifics of this type of lead and so occasionally my sketching will then turn into watercolor painting and I don't mind having this as the pencil that I used for that base layer. The Pentel Orange comes in mostly because of its precision. Like I mentioned, the 0.2 millimeter is the one that I will generally be using, and so that is for any precise details that I might need to get into a piece. And for erasing, I basically only use a kneaded eraser unless I really need to remove something, just because, again, you don't want to damage the surface of the paper any more than necessary. And one of the fastest and easiest ways to damage your paper before you even get started is to excessively erase areas. So try not to do that as much as you possibly can and or try and do as much erasing as you can with a kneaded eraser because it will not create that same damage to the surface of the paper. But this is of course also great for lightening up any sketch lines if they maybe got a bit too dark for your liking. But something else in terms of not damaging paper that you might want to consider is using transfer paper. I find myself using this stuff all of the time, whether it's because I've worked on a more complicated sketch and so I don't want to attempt to sketch that directly on the watercolor paper because again, I don't want to excessively damage the paper with constant erasing and stuff, or I've done a digital sketch and want to transfer it onto the paper, whatever the reason, this stuff I'm using all of the time for watercolor paintings. And so if you do not have any transfer paper in your studio space art supplies collection, please fix that. I guarantee you will use it at some point and it's so handy to have around. You can get it in like a pre-cut sheets. This is just like a really big roll of the stuff that I've been gradually going through and cutting sheets to my desired size. I've had this stuff pretty much since I started watercolor painting and I still have, I would say like at least half of it. So it's lasting forever. Super handy to have around. I have no idea where to fit these into this video. So it's just going here, but shop towels. I know these seem incredibly boring, but shop towels are like these blue paper towels, but they are a lot stronger than normal paper towels. And what I do all of the time, like every single time that I paint, I take one of these, I fold it in half, <laughs> like so, and then I put this folded towel beside the palette that I'm using to wipe my watercolor brush on. So whether that is to actually clean off some excess paint or to remove some water, doesn't matter. I use this every single time when I'm painting, and specifically the shop towel, it doesn't have the same like fibers and it's a lot like more tightly woven. You could of course look at using a more recyclable option, but I find that one of these lasts at least a very lengthy painting session, if not multiples. I literally have one sitting on my desk right now from whatever I painted last, and you can probably tell there's like a lot more life left in this thing. A super random and not exciting, but it's something I literally use every single time I paint, so I wanted to mention it. Something else along the line of like miscellaneous painting accessory that I use every time time is one of these. This is what I use for my water cup and it is technically a brush cleaner. It is this a 
accordion style one that I'm going to open. This is a brand new one because mine, multiple ones at this point are disgustingly filthy and I don't really want to show you that on camera. But I believe this is specifically marketed as a portable brush cleaner. So it has that whole accordion situation going on and little handle. But other than I just find this is an incredibly good size for a water cup for me at least. Uh, it also has a brush cleaner uh, little disc thing at the bottom that has all of these little spikes and so you can very thoroughly clean your brushes while you're using them or you know help get that excess paint out of your brush uh, while you're painting very easily with this. Now I'm someone that really enjoys using ink with their watercolor paintings to outline stuff or just give it more of an interesting ink drawing texture. So sometimes for that I do use like a Copic multi-liner sort of situation the Copic multi-liners are probably the ones that I grab the most frequently because they come in a million different sizes and they're always like on my desk but a lot of the like fine liners of that type are waterproof and so they are safe to use with watercolor if that is something that you enjoy doing as well but most of the time I'm using acrylic ink specifically I'm probably grabbing the FW acrylic ink the most I just find it incredibly pigmented especially compared to some other acrylic inks but acrylic ink in general is probably what I'm using with a dip pen I just really love the effect that the acrylic ink and the dip pen give gives. Well, in that case, more the dip pen idea, the variance in line width that you can get with different dip pens. I don't really have a specific one. I kind of just grab whatever nib I'm feeling at the moment. So this is more specifically about the ink. This stuff comes in a million colors, so if you want really cool, colorful line art, that's definitely achievable with this. But you know, I'm probably boring and using the black 90% of the time, although I do use the white incredibly frequently as well. Which, a perfect segue, I am someone that really likes adding white on top of watercolor and you know sort of finishing up adding final highlights and details with white ink. I know some people hate that idea but I personally really like the look. That acrylic ink is one of my favorite products to use that for but I have a combination of various types of white that I like adding back in because they are all different levels of white. So if I don't want the white to be incredibly bright I just need to make some minor adjustments, add some minor highlights highlights and also want the option to maybe blend it out a bit, have it not be as stark, then I'm probably going to be using this Winsor & Newton white gouache. This is in permanent white. Gouache is of course like incredibly opaque watercolor so this is very easily blended out if that's what you need. Sort of the extra intense version of that is this Dr. P.H. Martin's Bleed Proof White. Now this has been described as a gouache like paint but it is way more closer to the consistency of whiteout because this stuff is the whitest goo in a jar you will ever find. It looks and feels like the consistency of like marshmallow fluff. It's very unusual but very amazing. So if you want the brightest, whitest highlights known to man, this is the stuff you're going to want. It can also be blended out quite easily as well though. Something that is of course super convenient and I use all of the time are white gel pens. I've been using the Sakura Jelly Rolls a lot more lately because it sort of dawned on me that they actually come in different nib sizes, which for whatever reason I didn't realize even though I had the different nib sizes in my collection. But that's of course super handy if you want something with more fine details, you can use one of the smaller nibbed pens. Now before we get into the actual watercolor paint, let's talk about what is arguably the most important additional watercolor painting tool brushes. These are all of my most used watercolor brushes. Yes, I know there's a lot in here. Also, this brush holder is absolutely a favorite. Do not want to turn this into a self-promotion video, but I did design the brush storage specifically for myself first, but I do now make these to sell, and I love it so much. It keeps things so organized and just like it displays all of the brushes like it's a store. But I'm not going to go through every single brush that is in here, but I will talk about some of my favorite lines of brushes. Starting off with the ones that you're probably very familiar with seeing in my videos, the Paulina Bright brushes. These ones are absolutely some of my most used brushes. I have four different sizes. I'm not sure if they make any more sizes now, but they are just so perfect for my preferred painting style. They are these very unique mop-like brushes, but they have a more condensed 
tip. They're just more shaped than a traditional mop brush, but they hold a ton of paint still, and I just really love using them. Speaking of mop or quill brushes, here are a few of my favorite ones. This one is a Raphael one. It is a size zero, I believe. Yes. It's a size zero. I really love when uh, brush lines have the like quill mop style brush in different sizes because there's quite a few brush lines where it like only comes one size, like this Princeton Neptune brush, I believe it only comes in like one or two sizes. And the third one that I really love is this Da Vinci Casaneo brush. Again, that's just a type of brush that I find myself using a lot in my work. I tend to like brushes that I can do a lot of different things with the individual brush so I don't have to switch them out. I'm not a big brush switcher. So when I find a brush that can paint really large areas of wash and do like really splattery loose stuff, but but still can keep a point really well so that I can do more fine detail in between that. That's my kind of brush. And the ultimate brush for that style that you can go from really large detail down to the finest detail with the same brush are the Winsor & Newton Series 7 brushes. Yes, I know these brushes are crazy expensive, but if you have ever tried one of these, you will know just how on another level they are. They hold their point like no other brush that I've ever tried. The size 2 one is one of the ones that I use the most frequently, and you can see it's not like a super tiny brush, but you can literally use the hair that is sticking out on the top of this brush for detail and control the paint with that singular hair. Because these are such an expensive, crazy brush though, I tend to only whip them out when I really need to vary that detail with extreme precision. So I do have a lot of other favorites that I probably end up using way more than these ones, but these really are an incredible brush type. I did sort of briefly mention it in the mop brush section, but one of my favorite brush lines are the Princeton Neptune brush. Brushes. These brushes were the first ones that I started sort of investing in. They're really reasonably priced, but they're really nice brushes. They're like a really good in-between, uh, like classic sort of watercolor brush. Throughout all of these brushes that I have here, there are very different degrees of bristle hardness, and these ones are like a really nice in-between brush. They're not too stiff, but they're not too soft. They keep their points really well. They're not crazy expensive, and they tend to be quite readily available in North America. So if you are looking at upgrading some of your brushes to maybe something a bit nicer, then I would highly recommend these brushes. Also, the brush line has a ton of different types of brushes, which is awesome as well. There's, of course, your typical round brush. There's liners, flat washers, the quill brush that I showed you, just a lot of variety within that brush line. Another longtime favorite of mine are these Royal and Langnickel soft grip brushes. You can see just how mangled these ones are, but these are much more of a stiff bristled brush compared to the Neptune ones. So if you want a bit more tight control, these ones are great. I also really love using them to lift watercolor and blend it together, which is why these ones probably look so mangy and rough because I've been scrubbing at paper with them. But these ones are really inexpensive, which is awesome, and they also come in a ton of different sizes and types. I actually have quite a few different types of Raphael brushes. There are these two. The orange one is a Cairo synthetic brush, and the top one is a soft aqua, which right on it, it says it is designed like synthetic squirrel, which is what the Neptune brushes are also designed to imitate. But I know I specifically reach for these brushes quite a lot, and I do also believe I have them in a few different sizes. I also really like these Princeton Glacier brushes. They are slightly stiffer than the Neptune ones, but not as stiff as the soft grip ones. So again, a nice in-between depending on the sort of mood and style I'm interested in painting that day. And the last brush line that I wanted to mention are the Winsor & Newton Cotman brushes. Now, as you can probably guess here, specifically the detail brushes. Now, the Winsor & Newton Cotman brush line is a very extensive brush range that I do think I have more than just the detail brushes, but these ones are my absolute 
favorite detail brushes. These ones are the typical round brushes in double zero, triple zero, and quadruple zero. I know the quadruple zero has like six brush hairs, but when you need detail at that level, you will be grateful to have a brush that size. But there are these really nice durable synthetic brushes that again come in a ton of different sizes, including really tiny ones. So you can get all of that fine detail that you might need in a painting. But I do have to give a special mention to this particular brush. And this is the designer's series type of brush. It is unique to the Cotman range. It's called a designer's brush. It is in size zero. And I'm going to show you a comparison between the typical round in size zero to the designer's brush. So normal round brush is on the top and the designer's brush is on the bottom. So you can see it is just a little longer. It's not to the level of like a liner or script brush where, you know, the bristles are sticking out like an inch from the ferrule. It's just that tinier bit longer in the hairs, which means because it is such a small brush, it would generally be something where you would run into having the issue of constantly having to add paint to the brush re-wet it, you know. There just physically are not that many hairs to be able to hold the paint and water, but because it is ever so slightly longer, you get a lot more work time with the brush. So I absolutely love this thing for detail work, lining things, just anything. Because the hairs are slightly longer, I find that it holds a point better as well. This is just easily one of my all-time favorite and most used brushes, so I had to mention it. And of course, the final thing that we have have to talk about in a watercolor art supplies video is the watercolor paint itself. Now this is my main watercolor palette and yes I know it is extreme. It has been a long work in progress and I definitely want to get into it because this is just overwhelming to a lot of people I know. But this is the palette that I have gradually built up over my 10 years of watercolor painting and it has grown to be this ginormous dream palette and this thing basically is all I ever want to use. I absolutely love this thing. I love all of the colors in it. It's so pleasant for me to look at because it really does showcase my journey of watercolor painting because I've had this thing for so long and have built it up over years and years of painting. So no, it's quite cool. I also know this is way more paint than a lot of you probably would prefer to use and also more paint than realistically any one artist needs. But I'm, I'm gonna flip to a swatch sheet because I feel less concerned about holding that up than this palette that could realistically just start, you know, falling apart since I'm holding it at such an angle. So these are all in color order, but I have them grouped in color order by brand. So here are all of the Winsor Newton professional colors. This row technically doesn't count because these are my newer additions after I sort of reorganized everything and got it all together a few years back whenever that was. And so this row is more divided by color type. So I just happened to have picked up a few different blues which I stuck over here. And then this is sort of like a miniature skin tone palette. They are very neutral colors that I definitely grab all of the time for painting portraits. And then the rest of the palette are all Daniel Smith paint. Of course, all of these paint colors originally came in tubes, which I have here in an organizer. So I just squeezed a bit of these tubes into some watercolor pans to create that palette. I just prefer working from pans. It's way more convenient for me if they're all out and ready to go whenever I want to. I can just grab that palette instead of sifting through my paint collection and finding the different colors that I need. Here is is the swatch chart that I have for that palette, which as an additional side note, absolutely cannot live without swatch charts, especially with watercolor paint when half of the pans look black because they're translucent colors, as you probably saw from that palette. You would probably never guess that half of those colors looked like these. I'm just going to go a full-blown side tangent here about swatch charts. Another thing that I would highly recommend if you are someone that is looking at gradually expanding their palette like I did, one of the first things that I bought was one of these dot card packs. Specifically the Daniel Smith one, I have since bought the Winsor & Newton one as well, but I bought this dot card pack 
really really early on when I was looking at expanding my palette but it's really cool a lot of different watercolor brands now make these dot cards so it is awesome because what I do is essentially turn it into a glorified swatch chart what a dot card is is a sheet of paper chart whatever you want to call it of presumably the entire paint range it has little dots of paint for every single color there are two sides there are four uh sheets total for the daniel smith ones there's a lot of paint here and so there are honestly not even very small dots of every single color. They're quite large. I have seen people actually paint using the paint that are on these sheets. But the reason I turned this into a swatch chart and would highly recommend it as a possibility to you as well is it meant that anytime I was looking at maybe adding a color or replacing a color that I used a lot into something maybe a bit more light fast or just more pure pigment or whatever reason it might have been, I had in-house actual swatches of the real paint that I could look through and decide on what color I might want to buy. And this is literally how I built that palette. Sometimes it was going through and just choosing unique colors. Maybe I wanted to add like a super cool unique blue or teal or whatever to my palette. And so I would go through here. You can probably see there are like turquoise dots beside some of these colors and those are the colors that I own. And yeah, I cannot tell you how useful these have come in over the years. And like I mentioned, I did pick up the Winsor Newton one as well because another thing to consider is even if the various paint lines have the technically exact same pigment name, compound shades, whatever, the chances of them looking 100% alike are almost non-existent. I'm pretty sure in this palette I have three indigos and two Payne's grays, there's a lot of different colors that are technically the same color and they look nothing alike. Like for instance, I know this right here is indigo and that is indigo. So this is Daniel Smith indigo, that is Windsor Newton indigo. And you can probably tell they look not very much alike at all. Now there are a ton of amazing professional grade watercolor paints out there. I mostly have a Daniel Smith and Winsor Newton palette because they are the easiest paints for me to get in Canada. There are a few others that are getting easier to get. I know Holbein is a lot easier to get now and a few other types that I'm definitely interested in maybe picking some colors up because every watercolor paint brand is very different. There's different degrees of granulation. They have different binding agents. Agents. Certain sets have very unique colors, like this set is a Van Gogh color. It is, I want to say, Naples yellow reddish something to that effect. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure, but to me it was just about ease of paint that I could get and also unique colors. I'm sure I will add onto this palette with some various unique colors from different paint lines. So if there's any watercolor paints that you think I should check out that have really cool unique colors, I know people prefer certain colors from certain lines because they feel like they're the most vibrant ones out of all of the various paint ranges. So I would love to know if you have any specific watercolor paint recommendations and what brand they are. I know that's an extreme palette and that is an accumulation over years so if you are someone that's looking at building up things please do not feel like you need to like all of a sudden have this crazy massive palette because you really don't. I would highly recommend just doing what I did and slowly building up. So maybe adding more unique colors from professional ranges and then maybe swapping out certain colors to more professional pure pigmented paints if that's something you are looking at doing. And to go with that, there is also this mixing tray, which is basically all I use. It's super compact. So there's 12 different mixing areas, which you can see I've clearly grouped in colors for when I'm using it. So that's what works for me 90% of the time, although I do really like using different ceramic plates and dishes. This one you can see has paint actually on it. I think this is still the like 40 year old Windsor and Newton paint that I tested out and I just put it on here and it's like perfectly good paint so I don't want to like scrub it off. So that's just sort of like a setup palette mixed tray sort of situation there. I believe I have a couple of these dishes and I also have ones more along the line of this one which is 
I think it's supposed to be like a soap dish from Muji? Yeah, this one's a Muji one. Thin ceramic dishes like this are really inexpensive to get and they work amazingly for watercolor. And you can see on this one is a good example. A lot of the plastic dishes will have the water pool up on itself and not actually spread out like you can see it likes doing here. There is some hack. I think it's if you want the water to stop beating, you put toothpaste on it. <laughs> I could be completely wrong. There is definitely some hack though of something you can like wash or scrub the plastic with that stops it from beating on itself. But the ceramic dishes are just so easy to get, it tend to be way easier to get than any sort of flat plastic palette. And they're also really easy to clean up. They like do not stain the same way that plastic can. Like I bet if I tried to wash my typical plastic mixing dish, it just would never be white again. And those are all of my favorite art supplies that I use for watercolor painting. I do of course occasionally add and mix in things here and there. You know, maybe a project calls for needing masking fluid or I will actually use a different type of watercolor palette. But for the most part, if you see me watercolor painting in a video, those are the supplies that I am using. They are definitely some of the best supplies that I have ever used throughout my years of watercolor painting and have helped me in creating some of my favorite artworks. But of course I'm always interested in it trying the next best watercolor supply so please feel free to leave your recommendations in the comment section but that is everything so thank you so much for watching and i'll see you in my next video